So welcome everybody um, to the panel on the role of formers in public health protocol. Now, peer counselling has been well established as a, as a method of uh, inducing behavioural change and we have an active community globally of formers who work in peer counselling to uh, try to pull people out of violence and try to prevent people crossing over, over that line into violence. However, we have no way of... Uh, well, there, there are a few or little guidelines on what uh, uh, formers should do in this counselling, and there are a few measures to uh, uh, judge effectiveness, what works, what doesn't work, and uh, guidelines on, on how to uh, manage the harmful effects that peer counselling can have, potentially. So I am very, very happy to be here with this panel. Uh, we have formers who have worked in... Uh, peer counselling and we have experts who work in peer counselling uh, as well and we have ex uh, experts on formers globally. As I said, we are focused on one specific part uh, in terms of peer counselling but there is a broader work that uh, formers uh, do uh, globally as well. So we are quite hopeful of coming up with some solutions to the challenges that we're going to be discussing today. So first of all, I, would, I think we should look at the broader context of what formers, the work formers have done globally, what type of activities, and some of the key issues and, and benefits and contributions that formers can have in violence prevention. Uh, prevention. So, Julie, can you please do me the honour of giving the, the introduction? Thank you very much, Gordon. Um, I'm so happy to be here on this panel and just so in... Uh, of the people that I'm on this panel with. So my purpose today is to give you an introduction and to uh, frame our panel. And to that end, I'm going to answer two questions. First, what are the benefits of engaging formers in peer counseling and other forms of CVE work? And second, what are the needs of those formers as they enter into this work? So the benefits, formers often have more credibility than mainstream actors with individuals who may be considering disengaging or maybe who be, may be in the process of disengaging due to their lived experiences in the community. Formers know what arguments to make, what signals to convey, how to speak the language, and what buttons to push. And this is going to be especially true in those cases when leaving a group doesn't necessitate leaving a community and where one is not wholly ostracized from leaving. In these instances, a former may be better able to build rapport and trust faster than someone from the outside who may be viewed with suspicion or who may stumble over their own biases and assumptions. Formers are better able also to identify at what juncture to begin that conversation on ideology, how to frame those conversations, and what arguments will resonate. They will know what topics to start with and what topics to avoid, where a person is likely to show more flexibility, and what topics might cause a person to shut down. Now, that is going to vary from group to group and person to person. But a former, I would contend, is more likely to be attuned to those, um, to those sensitivities, attuned to those nonverbal cues, and better able to make those judgments. And speaking more holistically, and I say this as someone who's first research on the subject was in Indonesia, and um, there's so many wonderful former-led programs in Indonesia, or programs where formers played a critical role on the ground. So speaking broadly, programs constructed by formers or in consultation with formers tend to be more holistic interventions, combining rapport building, economic intervention, professional development, life skills training, peer counseling, and if appropriate, those religious conversations and ideological conversations. And these programs are also more likely to help the targets of the programmatic intervention, but not only the targets, also their wives, children, and families in ways that standard programs devoid of formers 
just don't. They tend to build community in a way that those standard programs just don't. So that brings the second question. What, are the, what do we need to provide formers who are doing this work? Well, first, training. Someone who's going to work in peer counseling needs some training in peer counseling. Second, resources, and this is really important. A Formers are not just resources. Formers need resources. Now, for someone in white supremacy, uh, leaving white, for somebody working in the field, field of white supremacy, this could be something, um, just to throw it out, with tattoos, for example, raising money to get tattoos removed, having someone go with you to get tattoos removed, finding the right tattoo artist to create beautiful tattoos out of what used to be white supremacist tattoos. So that would just be an example. But there's also a third point, ethical considerations. In discussing the work of formers, ethics in the CVE space, in the peer counseling space, ethics need to be front and center. If an organization employs firmers, formers, first and foremost, there's an ethical concern for their security. Formers need to be, feel safe physically, mentally, and emotionally. Second, the day-to-day -day work of peer counseling can be traumatizing. Now this, I'm not saying every case, but there may be cases that trigger a person. And so formers may need peer discussion groups, a safe place to discuss these difficult cases and their thoughts and feelings on these cases. They also may need their own counselors. Third, ethical compensation. What is the going rate for peer counseling? Formers should be paid a wage that enables them to earn a good living. They can't just do this out of the goodness of their hearts. They've got to be able to earn a living. And there also needs to be ethical concerns on the other side. How do you engage if a former is ready to become a peer counselor? How do you determine credibility? How do you assess disengagement, deradicalization, reintegration? And if somebody is emotionally and psychologically ready, how am I doing on time? Um, yeah, another minute. Oh, excellent. Now, the literature on formers in CVE speaks about two points in time of engagement. One of the people who wrote this article was actually Gordon. Um, and it talked about disengagement or de-radicalization. In many cases, though, I would contend that people are in between these two poles. They have disengaged. They have distanced themselves from their organizations, but they may not have publicly announced leaving. They may be in the process of reintegrating back to society, but there's still some ties. Um, they may be in the process of developing a post-group identity, but it's a process. We need to keep in mind that de-radicalization is also a process. You're not de-radicalized or you're not. Um, people de-radicalize on some issues before others, and they may revise certain views and abandon other views. They may, people may revise previously held views over time as they come to interact with new people and have new experiences. And so de-radicalization is an ongoing process. Even among those people who might have begun peer counseling, they still may hold views in some areas that may still be outside the mainstream. And in some cases, that's okay. But we need to be able to gauge that, and there needs to be metrics and tools to gauge that. And I'll stop there. Thanks very much. I think that sets out the, the discussion uh, we're going to be having perfectly. Thank you. S Sarah, Life After Hate have uh, been leading the way uh, in, uh, in peer counselling. Can you please talk about the work you're doing uh, with peer counselling, please? Absolutely. Uh, and I'm really appreciative of this conversation, and I, I love the way that both Gordon and Julie have framed the issues in this space are that um, the, one of the real challenges I think we find in this field with peer counselors and formers doing this work is there's no standardization. And um, we don't have a standardization of the roles, uh, of the assessments, the training, and so on, like we do in other peer mentoring contexts, like mental health peer mentoring, forensics, uh, substance abuse, uh, occupational peer mentoring. 
there are standards in those fields. And so consequently, what we find are farmers are often in roles for which they don't have the training, the education, the development, the support. And we're putting pretty unrealistic expectations sometimes on farmers to do some fairly heavy lifting in this space. So in our role in, in Life After Hate, the role of peer mentors is pretty specific. And um, also, of course, there is a lot of flexibility within this. So the most important thing is that our peer mentors are establishing rapport with people who it is difficult to establish rapport with because they're reticent to trust. And I'm sure every one of the formers on this stage knows the challenges of establishing rapport with someone who uh, is suspicious of you, is suspicious of everyone in the world. And so they really need to develop that working relationship, that, that sense of collaboration together, that we're both working together towards some common goal. And that common goal is bettering that mentee's life. So they're going to learn about their mentee's motivation to change uh, or their lack of motivation in some areas. They're going to be problem solving around specific behaviors. So behaviors, some, for example, uh, we have clients who we're working with to uh, disengage from online behavior, no longer going to certain online spaces, no longer engaging with certain content. Whereas for others, it's no longer engaging in the social network. How do we slowly fade you away from this social network while building you a new, healthier social network? They're engaging in future planning. Uh, we're working on a new wellness initiative that follows the same eight dimensions of wellness from SAMHSA, the Substance Abuse and Mental Health Services Administration, which is what their peer mentors do with their mentees. Uh, and as has been said, our mentors have the capacity to challenge ideology in a way that the, those of us without lived experience often cannot. And they do that often by using appropriate self-disclosure. And that is one thing that really differentiates the field of peer mentoring from other disciplines like social work and psychology, where self-disclosure is often really limited or even prohibited completely. So one of the issues we have here, of course, is that standardization. And Julia also spoke to this. How do we assess readiness? And to us, that's that. Are they disengaged? Are they de-radicalized? Where are they at with their ideology? Where are they at with their reintegration? But it's not just about readiness, it's also about appropriateness. Not every former is appropriate to serve as a peer mentor. Not just because they are not disengaged or de-radicalized, they can be disengaged and de-radicalized. I see nods from other supervisors of peer mentors in the field. Not everyone is meant to be a peer mentor. And we need to be able to assess what are the qualities of someone who will be successful in this role who can really help someone guide someone else out of these movements and be part of these multidisciplinary teams. We also need training and certification, and that's just the beginning. So these are the early stage trainings like active listening, non-directive questioning, um, open-ended questions, assertiveness and boundary setting. And then there also needs to be ongoing development, um, case consultation, clinical supervision, staffing. It's called something different in every field but regular oversight and regular development of their skills and working with these individuals is essential. And um, so one of the things that what we want to be looking for, of course, are those iatrogenic risks, the risks of the potential for farmers doing more harm than good. And we can see that, for example, in not recognizing a client's stage of change, challenging a client on ideology who has absolutely no intention of changing their ideology. They may have come because they're burned out on the behavior. They may have come because they want to leave the social network, but they're not yet ready to challenge ideology. And if we come and we start hammering on ideology, they're going to leave our services. So um, formers can be trained in those stages of change and recognizing those using motivational interviewing techniques to facilitate that intrinsic motivation to change. And they're much more skilled at it often than even the most skilled mental health providers out there, social workers, psychologists, other counselors. There's incredible benefits to the role of having peer mentors. And I'm only gonna talk about three and then I really want you all to hear from this amazing group of people. Um, one, they are able to build rapport in a way that many of the rest of us who don't have this lived experience cannot. Two, there is a strong body of evidence that that rapport, that working alliance as we call it, 
lends itself well to treatment adherence or adherence in the program. If you have an emotional, a psychological bond with somebody, you're more likely to stick around, especially when it gets uncomfortable, especially when we're challenging you and especially when we're asking you to change most of your life in many ways. And then finally, our formers make us better at our job. They really serve as cultural brokers. They're the people who are able to translate what it's like to live in this world for their mentee to what it's like to live in our world. And so they're really a part of bettering us and giving us the skills to work with these clients as well. So I'd like to turn it over to this amazing group of formers who are serving as peer mentors. Lauren, uh, would you like to talk about your uh, experiences in peer mentoring and, and some of the challenges that, that, that you have faced? Yeah, so I've done uh, mentorship work for a couple of years now, and something I come across very, very often is clients viewing me as a therapist. So I often have to tell them that obviously I don't have the credentials to do this, but in a polite way. Once that rapport is built, like that's when the floodgates open. That's when they'll tell me anything and everything about their life. So to, to keep it simple, the things that I can help with, ideology, social networks, uh, violence and movement related behavior, and understanding their time there. Um, one thing that gets brought up often in client calls, or with my client calls anyways, is mental health needs. This is not something I can provide direct service for, and I do have to tell them that. So I have a bit of a working script for when this happens. It typically goes something like this. Hey, I can empathize with this. I've seen a therapist myself before. Here's, the, here's what the sessions looked like. And here's the results that I got from it. And I have had success with this before, too. Um, the other problem is many have also wanted me to be the only person that they confide in, simply just because of the trust issues like Sarah was bringing up earlier. So there are, pro there are obviously problems with this. So it is unhealthy for them if, as it makes them dependent on me. Um, it is toxic for me, as this can lead to phone calls at all hours, and this is a one-way ticket to burnout. Um, I know that I will do harm if I provide service that I'm not trained to do. And lastly, it's a very frightening thought if I'm their only source of sanity. So eventually that working relationship does need to end. Um, the whole idea is to encourage independence with them, give them the tools that they need to function in society. And sometimes this does have to involve them receiving a higher level of care. So essentially the last thing I want to do is to harm a client. I, re I reiterate this to them often that I do really care for them and I want them to have the best results possible. And I also don't have a problem explaining it to them the exact same way as I am right now. So in closing, the extremist underground already does enough harm to these folks, and we don't need to be unintentionally doing harm to them. We do have many things <clears throat> to bring to this space. However, let's work within our limits. Thank you. Thanks very much. Chuck, we were talking about um, the, the harms as well. I was wondering if you can speak about the harms and also this, this issue of should formers be vetted before working in peer mentoring? Yeah, so um, I've been floating around this space almost since it was created, at least here in the States. And uh, I just was going to kind of express a story that, you know, happened fairly recently that, you know, most people, I'll keep it kind of vague, but most people probably know what I'm talking about. There was a group that was, you know, doing CVE work. Um, they brought a couple of people on um, in, in very quick su succession from each other who were involved with some very high profile uh, white supremacist organizations, platformed them, um, you know, basically told everybody that they were, you know, free and clear and no longer white supremacists and now you should listen to them and they're the export experts. Uh, I know, you know, from direct experience from people that I've talked to that, that were involved with this, that they did immense harm to people. Uh, there, there was you know, sexual harassment, there was verbal abuse behind the scenes. They hurt people desperately. I, I experienced it myself, uh, and one of them was involved in a podcast that had, uh, was reviewing the Turner Diaries, which is, if you don't know what the Turner Diaries is, it's like the white supremacist Bible of how to um, enact the accelerationist program. It's, it's about the collapse of America, basically. I won't go into it any further than this. But 
I, I listened to this podcast because I was curious about what this guy had to say. And it, it, was, it was evident to me with, with my background and experience from, from the minute he started talking about it, he was using honorifics for, for movement figures that were just horrible, horrible people. The, I, like the, you could hear the glee in his voice when he was talking about this stuff, that, that he was happy to be platforming this hateful, hateful content about you know, genocide essentially. And, and he was doing this in the context of CVE and he had been, you know, platformed by a group that was, you know, getting government funding, and, and I won't go into it much further than that. But I heard this, and it was an hour podcast, and I, I had to turn it off after 15 minutes because even being out for as many years as I had been, it was it affected me deeply, drastically. It, it, it like my, my heart rate and, and breathing were out of whack. And it, anyway, so if if somebody who's been out as long as I had been at the time and, and been through the things that I have can be that affected by it. Imagine what somebody who just got out hearing this, that, that the people that are supposed to be helping you are you know, really supporting this radicalization on their own, you know, on this supposedly de-radicalization platform. Imagine the effect on somebody. So those are very real harms that can be caused when people get into this kind of work as a former particularly and and a aren't aren't ready i.e disengaged you know first and foremost and and de-radicalized and and b aren't vetted by the community at large in some some kind of fashion to do the work you know and and in in the case of the one gentleman that i was speaking of that reviewed the turner diaries I, I, in fairness to the community, we were all screaming, this is, you know, this hold, pump the brakes, this guy is not really out. But anyway, that's, the community is self-policing to a, a degree, but it needs to be better about it. Um, so, you know, vetting to allow somebody to be a peer mentor in your network should include things like an interview, that assesses readiness and assesses um, appropriateness. That's the word I was looking for. <laughs> I was thinking availability and knew that wasn't right. Assesses readiness and assesses appropriateness. <laughs> and um, and it, it would be very helpful in that context if, if um, somebody who is not a former is involved and also if somebody who is a former is involved. Um, and, and that way you get, you know, multiple opinions on the person's readiness and appropriateness. Uh, also, you know, collateral, collateral information, um, paying attention to what the community is saying. Like, you know, if, if you announce that you've got somebody who is now a former working for your network and all of Twitter and, and the rest of the Internet and all of the community is saying, no, you're wrong, you should maybe listen to them. Because the community understands itself, and you know the community recognizes the signs. And uh, anyway, so I, I do think that we need to do a much better job of um, paying attention to who gets into this space and and who is given a platform. I think this is why it's been very encouraging over the years. We've seen formers involved more in multidisciplinary teams, and, and that, that has helped mitigate those those risks and potential harms to, to others. The, the other harm, as has been mentioned, is also the potential harm to formers. Brad, would you like to speak about that? Yep, I think that's that's why I'm here. Yep. Um, uh, for for many years now, I've been I've been tossing around these ideas of, of, you know, how formers are treated in this space and how we have very select issues that we have dependent on our level of involvement or engagement in multidisciplinary teams and trying to be uh, a peer mentor. So I echo Sarah's uh, standardization, calls for standardization. I think um, the teams that include uh, people that have, uh, you know, the count, their counseling background, psychologists, all of this has been really helpful for formers to learn about what, you know, what services 
we should be and, and having these services available at our hands has been like, okay, so we build the rapport, we get them into the program, and the next step is, well, how do we get them services in, in the communities? How do we get them mental health services? All of these different things um, I've been able to learn from to make this, the safe uh, the safe spaces for other formers to work in this too and, and share that, that knowledge and try to expand the space and make it a safer space for formers to work in so they're not harming themselves and others. So um, one of the things that's near and dear too is that when we think about D&D, &D, and I'm not talking about the game, uh, disengagement and de-radicalization, um, we really need to also be there to advocate. As Chuck has been saying, we need to vet, we need to do those sorts of things. But we need to be there to advocate for these folks that do want, as they're coming through these, you know, I've, I remember going through it, and Lauren remembers, Chuck remembers, going through the process of saying, okay, yeah, maybe I want to give back. I want to work in this space now, right? And that's, um, you know, that's something that we do as a community, as formers, uh, to work together to, to build a safer space for us. Um, but I think uh, some of the other things that I've focused on were how do we say we're not formers anymore? When do we become professionals in this space along with the other folks, right, uh, that are working in this space? Do we have to live with this label forever as formers? Or can we be peer mentors and Yes, we have these experiences as human beings, but there has to be a space for folks who don't just want to be formers, per se, forever. So um, how do we do that? Well, we're, we're in the midst of trying to learn more and more about that as we go through time here. But um, I think creating these conversations like this is very important as well, so we get the feedback of all the people that are working around in the space. So we can continue to uh, reduce labeling, reduce this whole like stigma of formers and, traumatize, and tra traumatizing each other by too quickly out there or it took too long to get there and not being included in discussions. We've got to make sure that we're taking uh, um, all of these things into consideration so we can make this uh, alternatively the safer space for all of us to be working together. So I'll keep it short. A concern is that some organisations, or some, in some cases, formers are exploited. What, what are the issues with that, and how can that be mitigated? That's open to anyone. Um, I think that the former being involved with an, an organisation like Life After Hate or Parents for Peace, I, I just want to shout out to both of the directors and the operations director at both places, like they have done an excellent job at protecting us and building a hedge around us. Uh, because at the end of the day, formers are an asset, right? And when you have money in the bank, you protect that money in the bank. When you have investments, you protect those investments. When you have an asset, you, you protect it. And, you know, Sarah, Miriam, Emma have done a great job at just protecting, you know, I know for a fact me and Mubin are, are protected immensely. And I know that Sarah protects her assets at Life After Hate, so um, it's it's simple as that. You you protect the things that, that matter to you. So I think that the fact of finding the organization that's credible and and has legitimacy in the field is going to kind of mitigate the need to protect the asset, right? Like those organizations that are, are not credited, that are just kind of like pop up here and their organizations are going to kind of fall off. And, you know, I mean, you can't police all the organizations that are going to pop up. But what you can do is invest in the ones that are there, that are doing the work, and that are putting the effort into to protecting for them. I appreciate that you used the word exploit because um, I think that I see a lot of formers being exploited in a lot of different ways in this space, and, it, and I'll speak just to the, the role of being a peer mentor. And I think it's exploitative to expect perfection from anyone. We've talked about this in, in any part of this field, but we often lay this expectation that people who've exited violent extremist movements are now experts in getting other people out. And then we put this expectation on people who want to help who want to be there and support others in this journey and say, great, you're, you're, you're completely responsible for this process because we think you can do it by yourself. Ready, set, go. And um, I think that's exploitative. Um, I think it, it, if we don't build the right supports around them, and I appreciate because I, I agree, Chris, I see 
the supports being built around all the people on this stage. And that's why you guys sit here and we respect everybody on this panel because we know that you're being cared for. We know that we're watching for the impact on you as well. It is not easy to listen to these stories day in and day out and have lived that same experience. And I think farmers feel an additional level of responsibility because of their lived experience, that this is part of their accountability. And then we lay this unrealistic expectation on them. And it's just this recipe for, um, for exploitation and, and additional trauma. If I can add a little bit on the exploitive uh, place. The placeholder is not just in the intervention space, though, of the exploits of formers. Oftentimes, it comes with media. Uh, they're expected to show up to every media interview, every you know conference to talk about their the worst things in their lives. Um, and you know, when people come and they you know are trying to get help from Life After Hate or our Evolve program that I work with up in Canada, I when they say they want to go public with their story, it's a work, like we work through this and, and we go, you know, nobody did that with me. I ended up taking part in a documentary. I didn't know what was gonna come of it, but a lot of things were helpful, but there's also a lot of exploitive stuff that went on that should never have happened. So, and I know lots of other people here can see that you're just, a, the expectations sometimes are way up here and that can't be. Right. So the organizations have really stood up and said, hey, here's some, you know, for us in our space there, you know, we're working together to try to make this a better, uh, a better space for all of us. Right. Um, and that by training, uh, self-care, uh, our awareness for each other when we need to tap out for uh, for the weekend and not work with clients and not work on our former life. We uh, that's very important. So, yeah. I think another, <clears throat> excuse me, another version of exploitation that I've seen is taking brand new formers and organizations just, you know, throwing them to the wolves essentially with the media and, you know, go out there and tell your story when, when they haven't really had the time to work through and process and even understand their story themselves. You know, I, I mean, I, this kind of work didn't really exist when I got out and I had like a 10 year buffer between then and when it did. And I was barely re ready after 10 years to tell my story, uh, you know. And there, there's, you know, there's some initial research correlating like length of time in the movement to length of time you need to really kind of process and, and disengage completely. Um, and I was in for nearly, you know, 15 years directly and sympathetic for 20 years, and so, like, you know, I needed that time to to get to the bottom of why I did that in the first place, how I got there, who I was, and who I am now, before I was able to even express that. And, and a lot of formers are exploited and thrown out there to, to tell the story when they don't understand it even yet. You know? I think that another really <coughs> cool point to bring in right now, where we're talking about like you know peer mentoring, uh, we look at the, the role that, that substance abuse, you know, peer support counselors, and I'm going to use the word peer support counselor. They, it's a title of certification. There's national peer support counseling, right? So in order to get a substance abuse peer support counselor certification, you have to have lived experience with peer support counseling. In order to get it with trauma or mental health, you have to have lived experience to get the trauma-informed care designator, right? A good time, like everybody knows that, that Parents for Peace got the DHS grant. Uh, one of the tracks for that is to create a curriculum to train professional formers. And like when I say professional formers, it's to A, vet the former that, that's going into the work to make sure that it's something that they're, they're committed to doing. Um, and to also provide them those motivational interviewing skills to provide them all the things that peer support counseling would provide you, but also give you that, that extremism designator or whatever we decide to call it. I don't know, it's still in the, the one week since, but it, we're, we partner with uh, Georgia State. And uh, I, I like what you said about like, when do we get to stop being formers? Like we've lived our entire lives by what we are, or what we were, when do we get to go, when do we get to become, you know, Chris? When do we get to become Brad, right? 
And, and I think that it's really important to look at the similarities between substance abuse. When do we go from being an addict to a counselor, right? And it's when we stop claiming that we're an addict, right? And that's a really abstract view on addiction. But when I was claiming that I was an addict for, I'm in recovery, I'm in recovery subconsciously, it left this door open in my mind where it's like, well, relapse is a part of recovery. So when it did happen, I was like, well, I'm an addict, right? So like when we decide that like we're gonna, we're, we're, we're working really hard at Parents for Peace to professionalize and standardize this type of, of training so that guys like us and, and, and you know, ladies like, like Lauren and, and, you know, the other formers that come into this space can say, I want to give back, I want to continue to do this work. Well, okay, let's see, you know, let's see what it's going to take. Let's get you into the training and let's start your process. I think that for peer support counseling, there was a thousand hours for state level certification in different programs directly supervised or in support of a counseling situation. There's a fee, a test. So like you, if you make, if you get your certification, like you're definitely in it and vet it, right? You're doing it because it's what you want to do. So when you get that certification, then you work with your, your, your organization and you, you do the work you do. And at that point, you're not, I'm a former, you're, you're a peer support counselor. And, and you have the designators to deal with that, you know? So I, I think that that's a really important segue into that. Maybe what, what are your thoughts on that? How do we make that transition? What training can, uh, is needed to facilitate that professionalization? Mm -hmm. Yeah, I mean, uh, if I can just, before I answer the question, just very quickly, uh, in 2011, then Google Ideas held this summit against violent extremism where they brought formers from four different categories, ultranationalists, white supremacists, Islamists, and urban street gangs and basically compared and contrasted how people got into the groups, the mechanisms that kept them in the groups, and then the ramps that got them out of the groups. And this is where you start to realize how uh, human the process of radicalization is. There are some core elements across ideologies. Uh, it transcended gender, religion, nationality, geography. It was amazing. <clears throat> and that seemed, for me anyway, in my experience, that was the first real former's creation, if you will. And then there was a lot of promises made at the summit. Uh, and we, and this is where I met <clears throat> uh, many of uh, the people who were involved still to this day. Um, and then everyone went off. So one thing was is that I saw that there was this community. And as the years went on, everyone kind of went off into their places and were doing their thing. And some got news, you know, documentaries and TV shows and this is like TV coverage or whatever. And just on the ex exploitation part, like, you know, how many times the documentary filmmakers would come to our house and like, they just, they just suck the life out of you. They are like vampires, okay? They don't care. They will be there from 8 a.m. to 8 p.m. And while your kids are around, your wife, you got to do your own thing, this, that, laundry. And, and then they'll ask done. you, can we film you yeah. sleeping? Like, like we'll like leave and lock the... It is so, they're, it, they're, is, they're, it was so <laughs> intrusive. We, we had two of them at one time on a, on a weekend thing that we were supposed to be doing. Yeah. We were doing one documentary. Another documentary crew showed up. We spent the whole weekend <laughs> with two documentary crews <laughs> arguing over who was going to get to interview us. Uh-huh, uh-huh. It's like a drive through So that, that's one, one side of the exploitation part. Um, another side, I would say, is uh, even in academics, uh, academia, right? I mean, no, I mean, we love you, of course. That's obviously, we're not talking about present company. But I, I'm just, I, I think it is the nature of research that, you know, you try to get as much data as you can and data, 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 right? Just like vampires a bit. And, and I, you know, I don't Thanks, know how many, no, look, look, not all, He's listen. He's not here to defend himself. Listen, they, I'm just saying that I personally spoke to so many academics. I have seen others, formers, all this research that we talk about, we know who the formers are that they spoke to, mm -hmm. right? And it, because it's a very small community, we do so, kind of self-regulate, if you will. So what, what I'm saying is that in those years leading up to this point, and so I do believe that now we are at a turning point. 
And all of this, and I think one of the, the, the more successful organizations, like the ones that are represented here, and like Chris was saying, is that the pop-ups uh, that try to come out and like, you know, they're like snake oil salesmen, right? Like they're just, they know there's money out there, they're trying to get the money and they'll do whatever they can to do that. But this turning of the corner and this professionalization that is occurring, slash has occurred, I really believe is a direct result of having clinicians on board with the farmers. One cannot exist without the other. It has to be a complementary relationship. I, I was always hard on the academics in the beginning too, um, <laughs> until somebody accused me of being an academic and I was like, excuse me, <laughs> right? that's, radi- that's re-radicalizing me. Um, but I think what, what, what happened with that is, um, the, because we do, I mean, you, the, the, the checks and balances that are there in the professions, that kind of attention to methodology, attention to, you know, uh, technical aspects of the work, quote unquote. This is not things that we learn. This is, we don't study any of this. We don't go. But yet we do see as formers that, you know, we could come in there and I could talk to somebody and develop a relationship like that. Meanwhile, the psychologist or the psychiatrist or the whomever they may be, they're struggling. They, they can't do it, right? Just at that level, they just can't do it. So, so, so to your question now, in terms of what trainings, I think the peer support thing is the best platform for that. We, we were not, it would be weird, I think. I don't know, maybe I'm wrong. It's, for me, it's weird for a former to become like a social worker because the angle that the former has, a social worker can't have, cannot, like as part of their code of ethics. You know, so we have a, a lot more leeway in terms of what we can do. And so I think uh, in terms of that professionalization, it's, it's, it's needed now. And even myself, I got accused of this many times, too. It's like, well, what, what are your qualifications on de-radicalization? You know, and I was like, oh, that's a good question. Good point. We'll you know, create that real it's quick. It's like, yeah, there's no diploma in de-radicalization, <laughs> right? <laughs> so so, so I, I like where we're at now. And, um, and I think it's with the guidance of those clinicians and professional practitioners that we're starting to get, well, professional formers or just peer support counselors. So. And I think it's the, the, the regulation that we have for each other, right? Like mm. we all, like yeah. we have that guidance of the clinicians that help us to learn our craft and hone it. But... There's also that self-regulation that, like, you know, that, that, that we all have amongst each other because we know that the work we do is important and we're all respective in our different spaces. And we, we need to work together and unify in this front because white supremacists are unifying against us. So the only way to push back on that is when we unify against the ideology. And uh, when we can strip it away and we can teach each other things that, that have worked for us, when Chuck can say, hey, look, so this worked for me, try this. Or I can, you know, give Brad advice or Lauren can talk to, to Mubeen. It's, it's, it's a force multiplier for military terms. Like that's a force multiplier in, in our success ratio. So the fact that like not one person on this stage is more important than the other is like, you know, I think we've gotten to that point, and just the, the respect that we all have for each other is, is exponential in, in furthering our success. Mubin, I don't know if you remember, it was probably me that radical, re radicalized you in Germany. <laughs> I remember being on the stage, say, I was talking nonsense, and I just saw Mubin getting angry, and I was like, oh, well. <laughs> so it was me. Sorry about that. <laughs> Iatrogenic effects, right? <laughs> I, I think one simple a uh, uh, deliverable we could probably hopefully achieve next year is for us all come back here under a, a title called peer counsellors. Maybe that, that could actually be a genuine you know, step forward because I, I always feel bad for calling you guys formers because I appreciate there's, there's problems with it and we do need to move on. Now I always know there's lots of questions in the audience uh, f- for, on this issue. All right, that's good. There is a hand up. I was, going to, I was getting worried there wasn't going to be any questions. <laughs> Um, first off, thank you guys. Um, I really appreciate that you can acknowledge your past and um, wear it on your sleeve. Um, so my question is a, a bit of a personal question um, for any of you to really answer. Was your change enacted by one experience or a feeling that built up over time? I'll snag this one. 
Um, and then like somebody else could take it too. So my my change was kind of like there was a certain chain of events that had to happen. So during my involvement in extremism, I was also involved heavily with, with substance abuse, right? Um, growing up as a kid, I uh, was aggressively molested by a close same-sex family member. So at the earliest age, I grew up with this hatred for homosexuality because I felt like the homosexuality that I had experienced was what every child was experiencing. Um, during my time in the service, I lost a close comrade, close as me and Mubin are to each other. And I remembered that same hatred had rose up against Islam. I hated it. I wanted to eradicate it from the earth, the same as homosexuals. Fast forward, I get out of the military. I, I had a back injury, substance abuse, loss of like the cognitive ability to differentiate right and wrong, impaired decision making, you know, goes on. So eventually I, um, I come to this like rock bottom. Right. It was the rock bottom of the movement. It was the rock bottom of my my addiction. But I think that the one thing that really was the, the, the game changer for me was the involvement of my wife, who and I've said this before. Um, people have a capacity to love, but sometimes that amount of capacity they have to love is the amount that they have for their entire lifespan with you. So. I feel like I used my wife's entire amount of love in that five years, and it really strained our relationship. But I think that the most important thing for me was the fact that there was one person on earth that didn't give up when everybody else did. Yeah, and I'll just kind of mirror that. It was, I'm not gonna like get all deep into my story or anything, but I will tell you that you know while I was in, there, was all, there were always questions in the back of my mind. You know. It, this is, you know, knowing that this is wrong and why, you know, why do I believe this? It's nonsense. There were always those little questions. And then, you know, I, I was traumatized as a child as well. And, and you know, I, I say a lot of the time that trauma brought me into the movement in a way and trauma brought me out also. But anyway, so there was the questions and then, you know, f like feeling that I wanted to get out for a while. And then a particular event happened that was kind of like a pivot point, but it wasn't really like a single event that brought me out. And then there was a long time, a long period of that after that of like processing and, and you know, really de-radicalizing and, and, you know, replacing the, the ideologies and stuff. So just uh, like the radicalization process, we talk about the, the cognitive opening, that, that thing that happens in your life that kind of makes you receptive to ideas that you would normally not be receptive to. So if you kind of reverse engineer that in the disengagement, de-radicalization process, it'll be something that affects you. And it could be a result is usually, it's never just a single event. Unless that event is so acute, then it could have that sort of effect. So I knew, uh, you know, former Islamist, supremacist, kind of getting out and uh, a number of things were happening for me along the way. Got married, you know, in the middle of that, so that calmed me down a lot, but I was still kind of not really, and then 9-11 happened. And I mean, that was a very acute event. It, the, the amount of people that were watching that event, uh, consuming the same trauma that every, everyone's discussing it. So that became a, that major cognitive opening for me personally. But to your answer, like, there'll never be just one event it will be a buildup of smaller and then maybe bigger events. I would like to say I'm very hopeful that in the next, in the year, coming year, we will be making continued steps to achieving uh, 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 things that can improve the work that uh, you have all been doing in terms of peer mentoring, um, but in terms of professionalisation, uh, once again, congratulations on, on the grant. That, that, that's, a, that's a huge achievement. Um, and also in terms of uh, establishing ethics for involving formers in, in this space, I think that is going to be um, uh, something that is achievable in that time. Don't you have an article coming out on this? Or? And I also have a book <laughs> coming out on this. <laughs> yeah. Thank you very much. Yeah. Uh -huh. uh -huh. uh, so that will be a book on uh, about formers and it's, it's drawn on experiences throughout the globe uh, and hopefully that will be something that's useful for people uh, uh, working in this space. 
Thanks. Um, so <laughs> I would like just to but end. He's not an academic, he says. <laughs> yeah, look, you, you can't plug your own book as the moderator, right, right. but like but your homies yes. can plug yes, your book for right. you. Yeah. Exactly, yeah, it's absolutely fine. All right, so we are all, some of us are going to have to rush off to another panel. Um, so can you all please just join me in saying thank you to our speakers.